high temperature superconductor based nuclear fusion is going to yield some really exciting results. You can look no further than all these startups that are invested heavily by private sector investors. I also think in the next five to 10 years, people will know better what type of superconductors will be needed to build the next superconducting quantum computer platform. The development in room temperature superconductor is going to have the same amount of impact as fire. Earlier this summer, there had been one Korean team reporting the first ambient pressure room temperature superconductor. The news of this breakthrough has really garnered a lot of public attention and also academic attention overnight. My name is Yu He, and I'm a system professor in Yale Department of Applied Physics and Physics. One major portfolio is to look at high temperature superconductivity. I remember when I was a high school student, I went to this science fair. Some folks from these fancy research labs, they demonstrated a very interesting setup where you have some floaty objects just levitate by itself on some magnet. It was just really cool. Later on, when I actually learned physics, quantum mechanics, solid state physics, I realized that superconductivity is really behind many of these leading technological advances we consider as a future generation of the society. When we run electrical current through, say, a copper wire, or run it through your CPU, when you're mining your Bitcoin, you're going to feel a lot of heat. This is because in normal materials, if you were to pass electrons through them, the electrons are going to be bounced off of the material atoms and it, all these bouncing off events are going to eventually become heat. Superconductor is a type of material where if you were to pass the electricity through them, you're going to not have any heat loss. This is particularly amazing because nowadays a lot of energy is lost during energy transfer from the power plants to our household appliances. And this will really help us cut down the energy loss, I suspect. That's only a tenth of the voltage we use in our homes. Watch what happens when we run the same 12 volts through the superconductor. Superconductor or superconductivity only occur below a certain threshold temperature. So everything dates back to the early 20th century. By that time, there's one glaring question that almost every physicist has been thinking about, which is how matters will behave when you approach absolute zero temperature. Absolute zero temperature is a temperature that is known to be unattainable on a theoretical ground based on the basic law of thermodynamics. It is a temperature when most of the molecules and atoms and the electrons they are going to stop their classical motion. And back then, big physicists has argued at this temperature, all materials would either become an insulator, which is a type of material that would not conduct any electricity, or all the metals would have zero resistance meaning that they all become perfect at conducting electricity. Where physicists, physicists try to explore experimental realization of these behaviors and materials. As people try to cool the material down to lower and a lower temperature, on an April day of 1911, a scientist named Carmeli Anis, he found out that in solid mercury, the resistance would all of a sudden disappear as the temperature dropped to below 4.2 Kelvin, which is all more than minus 400 Fahrenheit or more than minus 270 degrees Celsius. They checked and checked and checked many rounds of experiments day and night. It's really just a zero, zero in the sense that it's below the detection threshold of any available technology back then. So that was really the eureka moment of discovery of superconductivity, meaning that the resistance of the material will drop to below a threshold that is detectable by then technology. Then a lot of physicists are trying to understand why this would be the case, because it will not be captured by any known theory by that time. It was not until 1950 when uh, John Barding, Leon Cooper, and uh, Robert Schrieffer uh, came up with this uh, widely recognized theory of superconductivity in 1957. So that was a major watershed moment that signaled our microscopic understanding why superconductivity happens. Then, of course, people have looked at this theory and tried to apply it to describe superconducting materials and even at some point tried to predict superconducting materials. But people were not able to really increase the transition temperature of superconductivity until in the 1980s. 
It came totally as a serendipity in 1986 when uh, Muller and Bettmorz, the two physicists working on oxide insulators, uh, found out that superconductivity of unprecedented robustness can actually be discovered in some type of oxide ceramics. It's totally opposite to all the dogma that people have thought where you should look for superconductivity. That was in 1986. Within six months, people were able to reproduce discovery, the experimental discovery. And that was held as one of the major moments, the birth of high temperature superconductivity in this particular case based on copper oxide based ceramics. So I would think these are really major watershed moments of superconductivity research. There are so many interesting applications that superconductivity can drive. Even nowadays in uh, Long Island, I think starting from 2008, there has already been the first demonstration of superconducting electrical grid. It's power rated to a few hundred megawatts. The last year in China, people have demonstrated maglev train that doesn't need any major active electrical power input. There are also recent efforts to use superconductors to make extremely strong magnetic fields and what that means is you can use them to make small miniaturized MRI machines. There are also applications very recently uh, involved in nuclear fusion technology. A lot of us know our mankind has been riddled with energy crisis. One common way that can be used to alleviate this crisis is to go to nuclear fusion technologies. And the leading technology for nuclear fusion is to use very, very strong magnetic field to confine plasma or very hot electron and atom gases and force them to interact with each other to fuse. In order to get to these high magnetic field in the past or even present day, most people have to use very giant magnets made by copper coils. But the issue is when you run such high current to generate such high field, they will usually overheat, or at least you have to inject a lot of energy to keep the magnetic field going. Just from two to three years ago, people started to realize that with a new technology to make electrical tapes composed of high temperature superconductor, you can actually run very high current without any heat generation. And there has been a startup company spun off from MIT and also nowadays everywhere in the world trying to make these much smaller form factor magnetic confinement setups to facilitate nuclear fusion based on plasma confinement. That's also something that's really attracted a lot of investment from private sectors. Everyone is very hopeful that advancing superconducting technology can bring nuclear fusion really to our everyday life in the near future. Scientists in South Korea claim to have created such a substance, a superconductor. They're calling it LK99. I agree with the statement that the development in room temperature superconductor is going to have the same amount of impact as the invention of fire. So room temperature superconductor is the type of material that we mankind still aspire to find that can support superconductivity at our ambient temperature. This is obviously important because we don't want to always use superconductors by putting it inside a big cold fridge, but we really want to be able to just use it in a simple way that we can just hand it around without any additional protection. Earlier this summer, there had been one Korean team reporting a first ambient pressure room temperature superconductor. The news of this breakthrough has really garnered a lot of public attention and also academic attention overnight. We were all very excited. In the meantime, there's also a lot of skepticism that we also hold and we share with a lot of scientists all over the world. Those of us who follow closely with uh, high temperature superconductivity research, actually every few years, there will be a few reports of room temperature superconductivity under ambient pressure. Up until then, every single one of them failed to be reproduced by other research groups independently. So alongside with such major claim, there's always a mixed emotion of excitement and skepticism. So did we feel. Also, one other thing I want to mention is to say there is an oversupply of information these days. For our general public, it's really important to not be swayed by sensational news titles, but really take one step back and see if these discoveries have already been verified independently by other research groups. You should not take everything as it's being advertised. Every discovery, every statement has to have a logic behind it. 
First, I have to say, I myself find it challenging to keep up with all these exciting technological developments in modern day research. But I think an important note, maybe out of my own experience, it's probably impossible to keep up with all these rapid developments. But it's very important to keep an open mind, whether it's in your direct line of interest, your direct line of research or not. Because we mankind at this stage have accumulated so many different domains of knowledge Cross-pollination, interdisciplinary inspirations often happen in most unexpected places. So you really need to keep an open mind. Talk to experts in the field, ask them to give you high-level views, just like what we're doing right now. That's how I keep up with a lot of new developments in science and technology. I think changes always happen little by little. I never expect the world to change all of a sudden. Even when ChatGPT and large language model has received so much great success over the past few months, you see the world is still changing little by little. And my view does not differ in terms of the development in quantum technology. But I firmly believe that in the next five to 10 years, one should see a significantly broadened application of superconducting technologies, including its use in medical research, its use in public transportation, its use in computation, even more broadly due to the rapid development in quantum materials research, where people are looking to how to make more robust magnets, how to make materials that can switch between metals, insulators, and superconductors, in addition to those amazing applications we already have today. I view technology as our friend. We're all playing hide and seek with mother nature, and that process in and of itself is very interesting. Of course, there are unfortunate scenarios where discoveries in basic science and the technology becomes used in technological development that harms our values. But I should say, in most technological developments, the benefit outweighs the downsides created by those corner cases where technology is used for unethical applications. And we should not reject the technology just because they could be used in ways that may harm us. On the other hand, I think this actually provides incentive for our lawmakers, even our general public, to actively participate in the development of technology and the regulation of technology to ensure that we rip the maximum amount of benefit out of it and to limit the downside of the technology to the minimum. In the case of superconductivity research, or more broadly, quantum material research. I think it's so fundamental that everyone should embrace the vast possibilities and opportunities that may enable for our future lives.